Japan, the year 1605. Hidetada Tokugawa succeeds his father as shogun. He rules the country from Yido, the city known today as Tokyo. As a clan leader, your goal is to gain favor with the new shogun and achieve more fame than your rivals. There are several ways to reach your goal. Will you try to complete as many glorious missions as possible, influence the shogun during private audiences, or buy lots of luxury goods from the European merchants? It's all up to you, but beware of fateful events, ambushes, and watch patrols that challenge your wit and serenity. So gather your disciples and enter the gates of Yido. That was well done. Nice. nice. Very nice. <laughs> all right. So the goal of the game is victory points. All right. We have a victory point track around here. That's all I'm going to talk about yet about the goal of the game. Let's go ahead and talk about what it is that you guys are looking at. Well, first off, we have the main game board here. And the main game board, uh, well, we have a whole bunch of worker placement locations. We have all this. So let's break it down. We have, the, as I said, the victory point track goes around the outside, sort of, only goes the halfway. Ironically, I've never seen anybody eclipse 50. Last night when we were playing this, I said that this would somebody would the winner would finish somewhere around there. So between say 38 and 48 points, and uh, Ken proved me right, finished at 48 points. So there we go. All right. So we have the victory point track there. Now we have the actual town of Yido, which is uh, divided into seven dis uh, seven different districts. We'll start out. Here we have the Castle District, then going clockwise around there, we have the Gates District, the Tavern, the Harbor, the Red Light District, hey -o, the Market District, and the Temple District. All right. Now, above all of that, we have a bunch of different cards and other action spaces which are going to come into play during the bidding phase. But in the display as we have, we have the action card deck, we have the bonus card deck. I cannot emphasize how important this is going to be as the game goes along. Then we have the weapons, then the annexes, which are going to be little buildings that you can uh, build and will provide you with bonuses. We have geisha, we have extra workers, which are going to be these guys, and we have the mission cards over here. Now, we also have the event deck there. Then over in the very top left corner of the board, we have the player order track, and then we have the bidding track to the right of that. Now, just to the left of the bidding track is the egress space. Basically, pull, pull, pull chalks and just pull, you know, eject out of the bidding and go ahead and get yourself three bucks if need be. All right. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Now each of the locations also have worker placement spaces because at its core this is a worker placement and a recipe fulfillment game. Okay, So anywhere you see these little squares out here are going to be worker placement spots. Now in a four player game this one location here in the temple is actually blocked off as you can see there. So as it is, the temple only has two locations available. Then we have three over here in the market, so on and so forth. So it gives you an idea of what it is that you're looking at. All right, so that is the gist of the game or of what you're looking at. Now let's go over what it is that you're trying to do in the game. So Yido is actually the new version, the deluxe edition. The original edition plays over 11 rounds. However, the new edition, what we're going to be highlighting tonight, there are a lot of modular aspects of this game. The first one is the standard game actually goes to six rounds. The mid or the extended game will go to nine and the epic game will go to 11. We're going to play to six tonight and as you will see that's going to feel like a full game but if you can't get enough Yido then you have options to go nine or eleven rounds as well. This game does go to eleven. It does. Oh <laughs> well well done. I <laughs> crank it up. Here we go. Alright so we're going to play over six rounds for the standard game now. Okay. Each round follows the exact same seven phases except for the first round. The first round, we're going to skip the first phase, which is a prep phase or a setup, get clean everything up, get it ready for the next round. So we're gonna we're gonna double back to that and we'll actually start talking about the other uh, or the other 
phases within the round. So the first phase, as I said, is a prep phase. The second phase is going to be a bidding phase, which is going to allow you to get access to these things around the outside. Then after that, we're going to adjust the market out here with weapons, the weapons market, as well as deal with characters. Now the characters right there, we're going to actually go through the modules for the two expansions or the two add-on modules that this game brings to it after I talk about the base game and kind of in the middle of all of this. Okay, so we're going to set up the characters as well. Then we're going to reveal an event also in the adjust market character slash event phase. And these, these events will be universal and will negatively or positively or neutrally affect all the mm -hmm. players, okay? Then we're gonna get into an assignment phase, and the assignment phase is we're actually going to place our workers out here going in turn order one at a time, placing all of our workers in a normal worker placement a uh, action. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Watch Patrol, which I, I realize I neglected to talk about him, but we don't talk about him in, in mixed company because he is not <laughs> a nice guy. Yeah. So the Watch Patrol is going to move. He's going to advance around depending on whether he is the blue or possibly the red. Now we did randomize at the beginning of this, and by randomize we flipped this, and it came up, well not red, it came up Blue. blue. So the blue guy is out here and he starts in the Gates District. He is going to arrest any characters or any uh, any of our workers mm -hmm. that are in the area in which he goes to, which is that phase. Then there is a trading phase. The trading phase will work only between players that are in the market down here or the other location down the here. Carpenter maybe? Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, that's the carpenter. carpenter. Yes, the carpenter uh, area down here. So if players are here or here, they may trade things amongst themselves. We'll go over that in detail as we go along. And then finally, the last phase of a round is the actions phase, and where the meat of the game is actually going to take place. Now, I realize I failed to show you guys the rest of the items that are in this game. So everybody has a player board in theory. Now the player boards are, are, are big, um, these are going to be trimmed down, actually, but as it is, I wanted to be able to show you guys what the player boards look like. So on the player boards, you have room for things. So you have room for your mission cards, your completed missions, you have your workers, your money for whenever you build annexes. You have spots for your max three geishas, and you also have a room for your blessing token. And I say that singular because you're only allowed to have one blessing token. And finally, there are weapon slots up at the top up there as well. So because these are a bit big, and I would have to zoom way, way too far out, we decided to forego everybody else's player boards because honestly, you don't need them, but it. I'm going to use it for you guys. To They're be able helpful to see. reminders of the they limits are. for mm -hmm. each of these. Exactly. All right. All right. So that said, let's go into how you actually play Yido. So, in phase one of the seven phases, the first thing you're going to do is advance the turn marker. Well, obviously, we're going to skip all this in phase one, but any bidding markers that are going to be out here, we're going to then stack up in turn order so that they match. We're going to place three mon, which this uh, precedes yen, by the way, so this is actually three mon. So we will place three mon in the church location here. If there is already uh, three or more money in there, we will then add one mon to that, and this will be kind of a, uh, a place where you can just go and get money. Then on top of that, Anybody that has a dojo, so one of these annexes here, anybody that has that is going to be able to get one mon at that point. And last but not least, we're going to go ahead and do some things with the characters, as well as draw one of the specialists out of the bag. But I will go through all of that, the specialist as well as the characters after we go through the main teach. So there's the prep phase. The second phase is the bidding phase. Now the bidding phase, you're going to notice below each of these locations, there is some amount of mon shown. And what's going to happen is whoever's first in turn order, so in this case, as it will randomize it before we get started, but as it is, I am yellow, so I would go first. I would have my option to put up for auction or for bidding any of these things. 
and we would be able to get the winner of that bid would be able to uh, r receive whatever that is. So let's say for whatever reason I say I want to go to the annex. So we're going to move my marker over here to the annex space. It is implied I must have that amount of money. Before this happens, however, we're going to call would anybody like to drop out and egress. If the answer is yes, then they say yep, and they will move their marker over there, and they do not take place uh, take part in any of the bids. They just get three mon from the bank, because you'll notice the cheapest spots are three mon. So if you will only have two, well, you can't even do that. So you're going to go ahead and back out at that point. Mm -hmm. So, other than that, I say I want to go ahead and put a uh, one of these locations up for auction. It is implied that I bid five mon. So I must have that amount to be able to. Everything is open information except for cards. So any of your missions, your bonus cards, or your action cards are hidden. Otherwise, everything else is right. uh, open information, including money. So I say it's five. Then in turn order, so in this case, Jess, she either ups the bid or passes for it's a once around. So let's say she says seven, yeah. then it goes to Lee who says, nope, not interested. Then Ken says, you know what, I'll go nine. I now have, I not only put in the first bid, I also get the option for last licks. So I can either up the bid to 10 and win it or pass. If I win it, then I pay that whatever the money is to the bank. I leave my marker there, I take one of the INXs, I take it onto my player board, and I will score two points. However, let's say I chose not to and I said, nope, Ken, you can go ahead and pay your nine bucks. In that case, my marker will go back to the top and Ken's marker, his blue one, will come out and go into that location and now he would do the exact same thing. Right. But he's now out of it and that location is now not available for bidding. And who bids now? Well, who's top of the bid track? Oh, that'd be me, because I didn't win. So then I say, you know what? Maybe now I want weapons. So I come over here, I go to the weapon location, implied three or three mon bid, then Jess, then Lee, we do it again. If one of them bids and I choose not to outbid them, then they would put their marker on there, we would rinse and repeat, and we will continue doing this until I actually win one of the locations. So there is some strategy involved here in do I go for what I want or do I try and get people out of, and maybe this is really what I want, or maybe you get the idea, okay? So let me go through what the various things are out here that you can actually get. The action cards, you're allowed three of them at any given time. You know how you know this? Because it says you're allowed a maximum of three of them at any given time. And by their one-time use rule breakers, and there's a whole host of what they do. So what you would do, if you win that, you would draw three, keep one, put the other two to the bottom of the deck. The bonus cards. Let me pause for a moment and stress to you how important bonus cards are because there is very, very, very little scoring at the end of the game that aren't bonus cards. And as I've been told, if a game has bonus scoring or uh, in-game scoring, you should probably focus on that. Well, you're allowed two bonus cards maximum. Again, I know that because my player board says I'm allowed two of them. If I, at any point I ever acquire a third, I must discard down to two immediately. But you can draw a third to then discard. These are in-game points. All of them. They range from essentially one point up to, uh, I think I've seen a max of eight, eight. I think. Yeah. Um, so they do run the gamut here, and they're going to affect various different things. But here, draw three, keep one. This is one of the only ways in which you're ever going to be able to get a bonus card. At the end of the game. Okay, for the end of the game. Mm -hmm. You have six rounds. There will be six bids for these at most. Keep that in mind, okay? Weapons. Weapons are going to be for recipe fulfillment for these missions you're going to be needing. So here, you're going to need, there are eight different types of weapons in this game. So you can draw the top three, discard two, keep one. Easy enough. Annexes. So annexes are going to be special buildings that give you, infer some sort of benefit for them, both a passive and an active. They are going to be worker placement spots for players that own them. So when you build one, you're actually going to take one of them and put them over here onto your player board, matching the symbols. So here we have a 
cool little garden, and I may potentially, during the assignment phase, put a worker on there. It will have a passive effect, meaning just that happens, and then there will be an active effect of when I actually man it with one of my workers. Easy enough, right? Okay, so we'll go over those in detail before we get started there. Next, we have geishas. Geishas are going to be for recipe fulfillment as well for these missions, just like weapons. You are allowed a total of three of them because there are three spots on your player board. Uh, when you go here, you're going to acquire one of them. Now, these are more workers. It is important to note, now it's going to be a little hard to not talk about the specialists, which are the additional workers. Normally in the base game, there are two of every color out here. For a total of, everybody starts with two workers, that you'll be able to acquire two more. So go here, you get another worker for that round. If you do not get another worker for that round, there will be a way for us to be able to get that, thanks to one of the additional modules, but Otherwise, these are going to be for subsequent rounds, not for this round like this one is. Okay, so only one person will have a third worker in the first round, potentially. Everyone else will get two. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. yep. Last but not least, we have the mission cards. Now, the mission cards go from super easy to <laughs> hard um, <laughs> and everywhere in between. All right, so when you go and you win this location, you can draw three off that deck. Look at them. Keep one. Put the other two to the bottom of the deck. And those are the recipe fulfillment. These are the core of the game. Yes, worker placement, but we're doing so to be able to fulfill these missions. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. All right. So that is the bidding phase. where we'll, We will continue until everybody has won a bid. Obviously, if there's only one player left, they're going to get it for face value, etc., etc. And if anybody is egress, they're not taking part in the bidding. Any questions about the bidding phase? Nope. All right, nope. moving on. Next is adjusting the market and revealing an event. Well, we're going to have two at most. We're going to keep whatever the left two weapons are of the five that are out here. We will slide and then refill. So there will always be five available for us to purchase. Six mon and eight mon, respectively, in the market. Then on top of that, we're going to then go ahead and deal out characters. Again, we'll double back to that when we get there. Then last but not least, we're going to flip over one of these event cards. And universally, they're either a uh, not good or a universal, hey, oh, hey, that's cool, for us. And it will take effect for the remainder of the round, okay? Yeah. Moving on now to the assignment phase. Well, the assignment phase is, well, place your workers out here one at a time in turn order. So now would be a good time, I think, to actually go over what the various options are, but before I do that, I want to actually kind of double back and go over the anatomy of the mission cards, okay? So we'll start off with one of the green mission cards. These are the simplest cards. So at the top, it has a type of mission. So this one says it's an espionage card. There may be a warfare, there may be an assassination, there may be various things. These are going to tie in with the bonus cards. Oh, for every espionage, score two points, right, at the end of the game to a max yep. of eight. Something along the lines of that. Then the title, which we will read because, you know, I'll be honest, these are actually mm -hmm. kind of cool. And what it is that you're doing a lot of the times ties in with the title of it. Now, this is placeholder. Yes, this is all Latin placeholder. Again, it's a prototype. But this shows the prerequisites for a given mission, and then the reward is on the white kind of painted parchment area. If you complete this, you get this, which is, uh, in this case, five mod. If I have a worker in the Gates District, and I complete this mission, I get five mon. Easy, super simple. If I also, the bonus is in addition, you must complete this, you may complete this. This, a lot of times, is actually more beneficial than this part, but you can't just do the bonus. There's a reason it's called the bonus. You have to do the base and get the bonus to get it all. So in this case, if I have a worker in the gates area and in the market, I would get not five, but I would get 10 mon. I keep wanting to call it quid because I was joking around and calling it quid last night. So there we go. That's a real simple mission there. Moving on up now to a yellow mission. As an example, this one's an assassination. Bushido respect, ah. This requires you to have a worker in the 
marketplace, you must have that specific weapon. Oh, you mean like that? <laughs> and you must have a particular type of the annex, okay? Now, I want to point out to everybody that the annexes here that are on the mission cards are placeholder and these are only available these are referencing the old version of the game. These will be updated, obviously. These just weren't updated in time. So the, I believe this one is the dojo that you must use or you must have in your tableau. If you do, anytime you see the flag here, you're going to score two victory points and you'll get five mon. Easy enough. In addition to that, if you also have another annex, which is the garden in this case, so you would need two different. You don't have to have them manned or woo manned. They don't have to have a worker on them, but you do have to have them. You must also have a geisha and you must also discard a blessing. So anytime you see that little arrow right there, that means discard. Okay. If you do have all of this, you get that. And if you have all that, you also get this, which is get two victory points, get a action card off the top of the deck, and get a choice of mission off the top of the deck. Unlike in the bidding, you do not get three, choose one. You get top deck, mystery meat, as we like to call it. Moving on to the red deck, as you'll see, these get progressively harder. Usually, not always. Be in the harbor, have a shuriken, have some smoke bombs, discard a blessing, and you'll get a point, an action card, and a total of eight mon. But if you also have somebody in the red light district, you have a dart gun and a rope, you also get a point, a bonus card, which again, this is the only other way you're going to get a bonus card outside of maybe uh, an action card or an event or something. Right. But this is those are the two ways, the bidding and this. And you'll get 10 mon. And finally, the insanity that are the black missions. They can be done. I've seen them successfully completed in a six-round game. Two last night. Right. I did one a couple of nights ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this one, you have to have a worker in the harbor, one in the carpentry uh, area. You've got to have one in the castle district. Discard a blessing. Have those three weapons. Have those two annexes. So eight points. When you're talking 45 points might win the game, eight is no joke. Get a total of 15 mon and an action card. But if you also have a fourth weapon, which notice you have four cutouts, you're allowed four weapons. And a geisha, you also get a bonus card and five more mon. Wow. That is a whole lot to do, but man, does that pay off fantastic. So you get the idea of what the mission cards entail now. Now, for the assignment phase, let's actually talk about the things that you can do. So we'll start off down here in the Gates District, okay? It's important to note that when you assign a worker, no big deal, you choose one of the locations. All of the locations in the given district are identical, except for the Castle District. Where you go dictates what action you're going to potentially do. This is the only odd duck. All the others, it doesn't matter if you're here, here, or here, you're going to be able to do the exact same thing. So in the Gates District, what you can do is you can recruit a new worker, which is awesome. I'm going to go over the details of this little add-on, which is here for the module. We will go over this in detail when I talk about it, but you'll have extra workers cost seven money. Or you can actually uh, uh, beg, uh, give up victory points or honor prestige points for money. One point for three bucks or two for five. Okay? Does that make sense? Yep. yep. In addition to that, there is a spot here with the little eye symbol which is called foresight. There's a, uh, a number of foresights that are available. This one is specifically for the action deck. What that means, look at the top three, put them back in any order that you want. So you know what the next three are because maybe you have something that's going to you know, be able to give you one of those cards. So maybe you want it to be the top card. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. All right. Moving on now over here to the tavern. I call it the carpentry because of this, uh, but it's actually the tavern. When you are here, your options are you can buy an annex or build an annex for 11 it was five, possibly, in the bidding. And you get two points. Well, you get two points here, but it's 11, provided it's a, 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 still available. There are three available in a four-player game, meaning not everybody can have all of them. In addition to that, 
we have weapon foresight in this location. Look at the top three, put them back in any order you want. Easy enough, moving on. Then we have the Harbor District. The Harbor District is the exact inverse of over here in the gates. Spend money for victory points. Four for one, nine for three. And no, you cannot do this multiple times. So you can't give up six points for 15, nor can you give up 18 for six. It's nine for three or four for one. This has the foresight for the bonus cards, okay? Any questions about that area? Good, moving on. And there's also, you can get ah, the money on the church. thank yep. you, yep. good catch. And the last thing is, whatever money is piled up here at the church, you can take. Okay, easy enough. Moving on to the red light district. The red light district has two different options here. Spend four money for an action card. Maybe you have some foresight and so you know what you want over here. Or spend eight money or two victory points to take a geisha. As long as you have room, you're allowed a total of three of them. Okay, make sense? Good, moving on. Now we have the market. I want to remind everybody the tavern and the market are the two locations you can trade with other people that share those locations with you. Now, if I'm here and the person I want to trade with is here, that's not the same spot you can't trade. But if they happen to be there and there, then you can trade, you're good to go. Yep. Okay. Now, this is a very important spot. The secondary uh, reason to go here is to discard an action card or sell a action card or bonus card for two mod. But the primary reason you're going to go here, this is how you're going, the main reason way you're going to get weapons. When you go here, when you activate, you can actually purchase one weapon. Any questions? Moving on. The temple. Come see Buddha. Get a blessing. There are four blessings in a four player game. I'll put the fourth one back up here. There we go. You're allowed one. Blessings do essentially two things for you. Most commonly, they are going to be discarded for possibly one of the missions that you're going to use. The other thing is, for the really nasty stuff that's in this deck, for the negative stuff, blessings usually will prevent it. If you have a blessing, if you don't find it important, well, you made that choice, okay? <laughs> the other thing is foresight. Either for the event deck, so, or for top three of a mission. Now, you cannot change fate. So anytime you look at the top three from the uh, event deck, you cannot change the order of this because fate's going to happen in the order it's going to happen. So you can look at it, put it back in the same order. All the other four sites, however, you can look and put them in any order you want of those top three. Okay? All right. And finally, over here, three different options. Here, get a point. Pretty straightforward. Here, top deck one of the missions. Pretty straightforward. And this is called the Bowery. This is how cha turn order changes. And this is the only way that turn order changes. If nobody ever goes here, I will stay first from now until the cows come home. So, what happens? When somebody goes here, uh, nothing happens exactly. And so what I'm going to do is when we double back to the actual activation, I will talk about how that works. And actually, it would probably make more sense if it were not that. you. Since there we go, first. since I am <laughs> first, right. All right, so that's the assignment phase. Any questions about the locations there? No. Nope. All right, then the watch patrol happens. The watch patrol will then move to the next space. At that point, players can play any action cards that call out, hey, you can have workers protected from the watch patrol. If nobody chooses to do so, well then, he's going to arrest any workers that are in that location. What does arrest mean? They come up here and you have to earn them back. More workers in a worker placement game seem good. Mm -hmm. Don't lose your workers to the watch patrol. That is really important. I cannot stress that enough. Yeah. Now each of us all of those, we have asymmetric cards at the top of the board. When you flip them over after the beginning of the game, each of us will have a blackmail card. A blackmail card is a one-time use, get out of jail free card. Okay, he doesn't arrest my worker in a given location. However, I use it, I discard it, otherwise it's two points at the end of the game. Okay, so let's assume that the watch patrol was already there and maybe he was moving to that location, and people smartly did not go there, didn't have to worry about it, easy enough, okay? Now, during this, yeah, and we'll just move on from there. Then, 
the trading phase happens. Well, in the trading phase, you can trade with whoever shares that location with you just about everything. The things that you cannot trade, buildings that you have built, because they're That's heavy. Thematic. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. That makes sense. You also cannot trade completed missions, because it's done. <laughs> okay. Everything else, pretty much, and you cannot trade blessings. Okay, because you weren't the one that went and saw Buddha. That makes sense. Everything else is tradable, meaning action cards, bonus cards, weapons, geisha, and uncompleted missions. However, if and money, I should point out, which is really important, so basically you can buy things from one another. Missions you cannot give the details about. What you can say is, oh, looking at what you have, you probably want this red mission. I'm willing to trade it to you for X, whatever X may be, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of times it's going to be, hey, you need that rope? I have this, you know, throwing star. Do you want to trade? Be like, yeah, throw in two more bucks because I don't need that. Okay, deal. And you can talk about and try and negotiate ahead of time. During the assignment phase, hey, Lee, if you, if you want to trade, maybe you go up here etc etc so you can encourage people you can table talk to go up there and nothing is binding etc until the trade takes place but people have long memories so keep that in mind any question about the trading phase here and here and we'll just announce it when it happens finally the action phase now you get to actually activate your workers in whatever order you want one at a time in turn order the reason that matters is, and let me go ahead and get a couple of my workers out here. Let me, let's say I have one there and I have one there. So on my turn, I say I'm going to activate one of my workers and I'm going to complete this mission. Now, it's important to point out, actually it would make more sense if I were there. I do not have to activate the gentleman or my worker that is in the Gates District for that mission to be complete. I could activate this one, or I could activate that one. When you choose a location, there are three things that you can do in a location. Number one, you can do one of those actions that I mentioned during the assignment period. You can do that, that's one choice. A second choice is complete a mission in lieu of doing what is in that location. The third option, which we have not touched on at all, is getting a character card. Okay, That is kind of a, I really don't want to do what I was going to do, I'll take a character type thing. Okay, We'll talk about those more in detail at the end. So remember, let's say I really need money, well, if I'm going to activate this guy for this mission, well, I can't get money and activate the mission. So maybe I choose to activate this guy, say, okay, this guy is going to activate the mission. Is there someone in the gates? Yes, I get five mon. Is there someone up here? No. However, if I activated one of them and said, yeah, they're both there, then I would get 10 mon. Then I would go ahead and pull off my worker back into my clan house and I would mark this as a completed mission, which then goes face up into my tableau, like so, I would get my money and my worker would come back here. Easy enough. Yep. Okay? Yep. So, complete a mission or do a thing in the area or get a character card. Does that make sense? Yep, yes. it does. That's the base game. <clears throat> Any questions about how to actually play Yido? No. Okay, no. good. Now let's go ahead and talk about the two expansions. The first expansion that we're, we're going to do this kind of out of order, okay? The first expansion that we're going to talk about is the specialists. Now, the specialists are the special workers that you see over on the right-hand side of the screen, okay? Now, the specialists are your extra workers. There are six different types of specialists in this game. Normally, we would have two workers up here. Those are removed and back into the box. Instead, we're going to have access to these six workers. At any given time, you are allowed a total of four specialists. So everybody has their two workers to begin with. Trust me, we have two. <laughs> and you're allowed a maximum of four specialists. There are six here. A new specialist is going to come out at the beginning of each round. So what's going to happen is we're going to go ahead and draw one out of our bag. Again, this is a prototype. This is going to be different in the final edition. We're going to put it up there. So the monks are available. So what we would do, and we'll actually do this for the first round. 
we will put the monks up there, and that's who you would recruit in this round. Easy enough, right? So if you go here for this location, you would then get an extra monk, so that would be your worker. Now each of these workers has a special rule associated with them. I will go over those in detail once I go through the actual mechanisms of this, okay? So after the bidding phase, and maybe somebody has bid on one of those and whatever, sure, then the rest of these cats are going to come down here, and they're going to be available down here as your worker. Easy enough, right? Well, at the beginning of the next round, we're then going to draw another one. And then they're going to come out, so maybe it's the messenger here, right? So then, again, the messenger will be available, same mechanism, but these guys will then slide over, the messengers will then come down. During the third round, same thing, you get the idea. These guys now go away. So they will move over. There we go. We have the workmen. Yeah, the weapon smith, maybe. You know, what are you, the work weapon. Yeah, well, we'll go yeah. over it. These guys are now unavailable. <laughs> They're out of the game. If you did not recruit them, you do not get them. They are out. Goodbye. Thank you for playing. So if you do, when you recruit, you can recruit either from this one or this one, depending on what the special ability is that you want. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Easy enough, right? Pretty simple. You get the mechanism of how that happens, okay? And I will let you go ahead and play Arts and Crafts you got and it. stack those back up while I go over what the various special rules are for each of them. So starting off on the left side with the female samurai. The female samurai, whenever you complete a mission with her, you can convert five mon into one prestige point and do it as many times as you want. Really good for late game for maybe eight to 10 points if you have a lot of money. So she comes very valuable at the end of the game because money's tight early on. Mm -hmm. Moving over now to the samurai. The samurai, whenever you complete a mission with him, he gives you an extra prestige point, an extra victory point, easy enough. Then. Moving on over from there, we have the weapon smith, as Ken so eloquently reminded me. This, you're allowed to have five weapons. Why does that matter? Well, normally, you're only allowed four. And let me remind you guys, some of these missions have four. On here, it allows you one extra, okay? And maybe a little bit of breathing room on that. Okay? Yeah, it came in pretty handy last night, that's All right. for sure. So there's that, and he did win, so there's that. Now, moving over now, Moving to the right, we have the messenger. Whenever you complete a mission using him or her, you get a new mission of your choice. Top deck it, okay? Then, moving over the monk, the monk always counts as having a blessing for the purposes of missions if they complete the mission, if they're using, if they're the ones completing the mission, okay? And any of these prophecy spaces, they get a plus one. So instead of looking at top three, you get to look at the top four, all right? Easy enough. And finally, last and certainly not least, the ninja. The ninjas don't have to worry about being arrested. They are immune to the Watchmen. Pretty nice. Yeah. Okay? So any questions about the various characters or specialists that are in the game? Nope. No. Okay. So now talking about the characters or the tea house module. Now there are, I forget how many, I want to say about a dozen, give or take, of the various uh, characters. Now, at the beginning of the game, those are going to be assigned to specific uh, asymmetric starting cards. So you're going to, we're going to choose whatever the bonuses are. But throughout the game, there's going to be five of those available in a, in a given round, and they're going to be a special rule breaker available to the player that chooses that character. However, the turn in which you choose the character, you do not get access to them. Remember, that is the third option that you can take. Either activate the area for the thing, complete a mission, or get a character. In that case, if you choose get a character, you just say, hey, let me have that character for whatever he is. He will then come over into my tableau and go face down. At the beginning of the next round, it'll turn face up, and now I get to do whatever the special ability is. And these are one-time use, usually, and it will say discard after use or at the end of the action phase. Easy enough. Yep. Okay, and you're only allowed one of these at a given, on a given turn, okay? Now, you'll notice that they also have victory point markers up here in the top right-hand corner. The reason for that is, in the last round, well, if you recruit them in the last round, you don't get to actually use them. 
So when you recruit them in the last round, that's what they're actually worth to you at the end of the game. So there's a little bit of end game scoring for that. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And any that are remaining from a given round, we'll wipe and we will then put out five new ones and then we will shuffle as needed and et cetera, et cetera. And that is the two new expansions. What I'm, if we don't use the character in that round? That is an excellent question, Miss Cassidy. So what you do, <laughs> if you choose not to use or you, uh, you can't, you choose not whatever, whatever the special ability is. So here's the nice thing. When I took that, I put it face down in my tableau. The next round, I turn it face up. Now I could use it. If I don't use it, at the beginning of the next round, I then lose it. However, you get a bonus card. Top deck of the bonus card, up to a maximum of two, and then discard down to two. But that is the only other way that you're going to get bonus cards in this game. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And that, folks, is Gito Deluxe Edition. I guess I should talk about endgame scoring real quick, which is real quick. Endgame scoring, well, if you're playing with the characters, it's going to be any points that they have. Uh, if you did not use your blackmail card, that's two points. And then score bonus cards, and that's it. Whoever has the most points wins. Good luck and Godspeed. Mm -hmm. All right? Not any questions in there, but yes, Rainer and Christopher Crowd pointed out that one of the geishers, it was actually just off screen. Yeah, yes. I was going to use it as a. As it was a an example. Player but aid, yes, but there are six yeah. geishers in there. There are. There so. we go. Uh, we need. Okay, so let me get all of this set back up. We need to shuffle all these decks because we did sort of precede it. Um, the other thing, and I'm sure that Rainer has talked about this in chat already. You need those there. Oh. You know what? Let me back up real quick. Let me actually talk about this. While you guys don't bother shuffling uh, the missions, you can. So here, okay. there. So the action cards. These decks are color-coded. There are three different types, okay? There are usually nice, neutral, and hurtful ones. And this game is very modular. So if you don't want any take that in a game, you can remove one of the colors of the game. So for instance, you would remove, I believe, the yellow color here. Um, so this one says, hey, play a, uh, when you purchase a weapon from the market, you may immediately take a, any weapon from the market free of charge. So you actually get two of them. So that's kind of nice. Um, and some of them show specific phases in which they can actually be activated. I suppose I ought to show you guys that because I'm so far zoomed out. But the color coding, this is another thing of the uh, uh, Deluxe Edition is that these are color coded for you can customize the type of game that you want. Okay, Just like the events. Now the events are also color coded here to where these are universally pretty nice. These are universally really crappy. These are universally uh, neutral. So there you go. So depending on the type of game that you want, you can actually go ahead and customize it for that. So that was the other thing that I wanted to point out. Okay, we will shuffle these up. I will bring the cameras up. I'm going to set the glory to Rome's. Um, even though this is Lee's first stream, I'm going to set it at five and a half because this game can be really nasty. Okay. All right. So, any questions from the peanut gallery? Um, just some points from Rainer. Oh, yeah, and Rainer points out that for the bonus on completing a mission, you just have to have, to have a worker in that location. Yes, you don't have to activate a worker in a location that is called out for either the base or the He's bonus. He's actually saying you must activate a disciple in the district shown. Then, then I have played every every. For the <laughs> bonus, the requirement is, is only to have a it. disciple. Thanks in the for the clarification, show. Rainer. I apologize. All right, so easy enough. So you do have sense. to activate one of the people that's in one of the locations. One of the sure. locations. There you go. Okay. Okay. Easy enough.